what I'd like to do is introduce uh, a relatively new technology. Uh, we, we published the first uh, research paper on uh, computer designed organisms uh, this past January. I'll describe this technology that my uh, collaborators at Tufts uh, and my group are developing. Uh, I'm a computer science professor here at the University of Vermont in the US, and this is work carried out with my PhD student, Sam Kriegman, and we're collaborating with two uh, biologists, uh, Doug Blackiston and Mike Levin uh, at Tufts. So uh, before I talk about computer designed organisms, I wanted to just start with uh, regular organisms. Uh, as we, we all learned in school, uh, DNA is the, the blueprint for life. It dictates how a given egg or seed develops into an adult organism. But uh, we're increasingly interested as a society about how to create uh, new living systems that don't just embody some new feature or an exaggerated feature that already existed in that uh, species and nature, but how do we create completely new living systems, uh, a functioning organism that is orthogonal to anything you see in nature. And uh, there's a few techniques for doing this. Um, our ancestors discovered tens of thousands of years ago uh, the process of artificial selection, deciding which particular organisms are allowed to propagate their genetic material uh, into the next uh, generation. And over hundreds or thousands of years, this can introduce non-trivial uh, changes in both form and function to an existing uh, species, but the obvious drawback is that it's slow. So with the advent of genetic engineering, we were able to greatly speed up this process by identifying some desired trait that maybe doesn't exist yet in, uh, in nature or it exists in some other uh, species and we'd like to transfer it into a target species. We take that desired function and figure out a genetic manipulation that may produce that trait in the target species. Uh, we introduce that genetic manipulation uh, into the target species and the organism that grows from that genetically modified uh, DNA uh, hopefully exhibits that trait. Uh, genetic engineering has some social hurdles to overcome or genetically modified organisms has some social hurdles. But from a purely intellectual point of view, there are some intellectual hurdles. The first one is how do you take a given trait and determine what genetic manipulation will produce it in the target species? Secondly, uh, at least so far, most of the genetic manipulations that have been successful only alter an existing species slightly by introducing a new trait or enhancing an already existing one. And the reason why is kind of obvious is that different parts of our genetic system talk to one another. So if we tinker with one part, we introduce uh, unknown crosstalk between other parts of the organism. And by adding something, we often break other parts of the genetic architecture and the organism either dies or never uh, develops in the first place. So there's a third way in which we can go about trying to create uh, new kinds of living systems and to motivate this third approach, uh, they'll just use a metaphor here. Uh, imagine that I wanted to have a new house built for myself. I retain an architectural firm. They work up uh, a blueprint like you see bottom left and convince me that with the right set of contractors that'll produce the house that you see on the right. Imagine that I have very exacting standards and I would like something even more uh, uh, spacious than this. I could go back to the architects and have them uh, work up a new set of blueprints or alter these blueprints. Or alternatively, we could leave the blueprints uh, untouched and then as the contractors begin to, to build the house, I could interact with the contractors and try and uh, convince them to interpret the blueprint differently. Um, I might convince them to use more expensive materials, uh, to interpret the numbers in the blueprint, not as inches, but as uh, feet, to build something much larger. Um, so you can ask the question, what kinds of perturbations could I introduce into the construction process that goes from a blueprint to a final product to produce something other than what seems to be the default encoding uh, in the blueprint? Again, going back to nature, uh, we know how to do this somewhat. It seems to be easier to do in plants than animals. Um, this is an espaliered uh, set of apple trees that you see on the right. These are non-genetically modified uh, apple trees. They grow naturally, but during their developmental process, uh, people have come in and trained uh, the habit or the growth of the branches to diverge from their default branching pattern. 
And in effect, what, uh, what the, the person is doing here is providing different environmental signals that influence the growth, growth process of the organism. And this, this isn't really that uh, surprising because we know that plants are very sensitive to their environment. They grow differently in response to different local light conditions and moisture conditions. They grow differently depending on what other plants are doing uh, in their environment. So uh, it's not too difficult to figure out how to quote unquote reprogram the growth process of a plant to get something very different from what you'd see uh, in nature. <clears throat> Animals, on the other hand, seem to, me, seem to be much less open to suggestion. Um, any one tadpole looks pretty much like any other tadpole. Any two people uh, don't differ that much. Um, that might not seem the case from a human's point of view, but, but biologically, uh, animals, or at least the body plans of animals, seem to be more or less hardwired in their genetic uh, architecture. Obviously, mutations to an animal's DNA can cause bi uh, body plan changes, but it seems difficult to deflect the developmental process towards some um, outcome other than the naturally occurring uh, organism. However, a series of recent experiments has suggested that animals are just as open to suggestion, if not more so than plants. This is just one example uh, drawn from some uh, work a few years ago of, uh, from my Tufts uh, colleagues. They took a non-genetically modified tadpole. They introduced, or they surgically implanted uh, an adult frog eye into the tail of the tadpole. Not only did the tadpole survive the surgery, but it grew into a perfectly healthy uh, adult frog. And during that developmental process, the eye and the spinal cord of the developing uh, tadpole sent out uh, ner nervous, uh, nerve fibers. They connected to one another and formed a functional neural link between the eye and the spinal cord so that the adult frog not only had a third eye on its back, but it was a functional eye and the adult frog could use that third eye for modulating its its behavior. So that was a pretty uh, dramatic and surprising perturbation to the developmental uh, program. And it leads to the question of how much of this reprogramming of a developing organism is possible? What are the right set of environmental signals that we could supply to the animal? These might be coming from outside the animal or inside the animal to deflect its growth away from not just a house to a mansion, but maybe a mansion to a space station. How far can we push uh, this process? So that's uh, a question we've been tackling with uh, our colleagues uh, at Tufts. We started on a research project uh, funded by DARPA two years ago, and that project was focused on something slightly different. And at the beginning of our collaboration, we had a weekly Skype call. One week, uh, we would show here at UVM what we're capable of, and the next week, Tufts would demonstrate what they're capable of. And we use these weekly meetings to, to find uh, a research project that would meet somewhere in the middle. During one of our early Skype meetings, uh, I showed our Tufts colleagues this video. This is something we spend quite a bit of time doing in my lab. It's known as evolutionary robotics, where we evolve robots in simulation and then manufacture them in reality. Showed uh, one, a video very much like this of this particular four-legged quadrupedal robot. The next week on the Skype call, uh, Doug Blackiston, our, our uh, surgeon at, uh, at Tufts, came back with this image, which was pretty surprising and took a while for us to figure out what we were looking at. What you're looking at is a very small sculpture of this quadrupedal robot that is built not from traditional robot uh, materials like metals and ceramics and plastics and electronics. It's built from frog cells. These are cells taken from a particular frog species, Xenopus lavis, uh, the African clawed uh, frog, which our colleagues uh, know is particularly amenable to suggestion. You can deflect the developmental uh, program of this animal quite a bit. This is uh, what you see in the bottom right is not a biological robot. It's a biological sculpture. It is built only from frog skin cells. So there is no muscle within this sculpture and therefore there is no way for the sculpture to move. So the next question we tackled together is instead of building a sculpture that resembles uh, one of our simulated robots, can you instead build 
a biological robot, something that has not just form, but also function, something that moves. The answer that came back to us from our biology colleagues is maybe, but it's extremely difficult. So uh, Doug attempted to rebuild uh, the Xenobot um, sculpture, but added in heart muscle cells. These are extracted from early frog embryo. Heart muscle tissue will spontaneously contract and expand. Um, when, heart, uh, when heart muscle tissue develops into a normal frog heart, all of the tissue comprising the heart contracts together and expands together, which is exactly what you want because the heart is a pump. You need it to expand all together to uh, push blood out and expand all together to pull blood into the heart. It turns out though, if you take frog heart muscle tissue and rearrange it and, and attach that tissue together in new shapes, like the shape of our four-legged quadrupedal robot, you do not get useful function. The, uh, what you see here are, are these small voxels or 3D pixels. Each voxel is meant to represent a small patch of heart muscle tissue. And as you can see in the simulation, um, they don't synchronize. They basically do their own thing. So if we'd like to try and construct a new, uh, a new creature made out of frog skin cells and frog heart muscle cells, most of the ways we would put those uh, pieces of tissue together do not produce useful function. If we do want useful function like movement, it seems that this is something that's difficult or impossible for uh, a human engineer to do or a, a, a bio, bio engineer. And uh, the reason why it's so difficult, uh, it, I can explain it using another metaphor. Imagine that I asked you to design a boat and you can design the shape of that boat. The function of that boat is that it should move straight and as quickly as possible. Um, the caveat, however, is when you put human rowers into the boat, each human rower is gonna row at their own pace and they're gonna ignore what all the other human rowers uh, are doing. So in essence, you're trying to build something where you have a whole bunch of randomly functioning uh, actuators. Those could be human rowers or patches of frog heart muscle cell. And how do you create something that at the level of the organism or the level of the boat has non-random uh, behavior? It goes straight and goes straight quickly, but is built from random parts. That's something that seems to be somewhat beyond human intuition. So that's where the uh, AI component comes in, and that's the part that my group was responsible for uh, in this project. So instead of specifying what the end design is, uh, taking a cue from genetic engineering, we instead describe a desired trait, which in this case is to produce a very small robot made out of frog cells, and it should move as quickly as possible. Um, if you're familiar with machine learning, you can think of this as a loss function or an objective function. We supply that as input to a search process, and that search process is gonna search in simulation over the space of all possible Xenobot designs and tag uh, the fitness or the quality of each of those potential designs. As it turns out, and not surprisingly, since this is such a difficult task, the vast majority of random designs that the search method produced like this one don't go anywhere. In this simulation here, the light blue represents uh, patches of frog uh, skin cells and the red and green is heart and muscle tissue. So the AI algorithm will delete that uh, that design. It'll move on to a second random design, which has a different overall 3D shape and a different distribution of skin and heart muscle tissue. This one also doesn't really go anywhere. The computer deletes that second random design and moves on to a third random design and so on. We're using a particular search method here known as an evolutionary algorithm or genetic algorithm. This is an idea that's been around for a very long time. And as the name implies, it's a search algorithm that's inspired by biological evolution. In this case, we started with a population of random Xenobot designs, 100 of them. You just saw the first two of those 100. The computer evaluates each of those designs one after the other and uses the objective function or the loss function to assign a, a, a number which indicates the quality of that design. In this case, since we're selecting for fast moving designs, the number is simply how far the robot moves uh, from the origin point. 
Most of those 100 designs don't go anywhere, but typically one or two of them may uh, collectively produce a small amount of motion, maybe a millimeter or two millimeters away from the origin. The computer will delete all the 98 non-moving designs and make 98 randomly modified copies from the two surviving uh, slow-moving Xenobot designs. The, the computer then evaluates and simulation the speed of those second generation designs. Most of those also don't really go anywhere. The computer deletes those, but a few of them may travel not just as fast as their parent design, but might move a little bit faster than their parent design, in which case they outcompete their parents, the parents are deleted, the children produce grandchildren, and so on and so forth. And we evolve this population of 100 Xenobot designs for several hundred generations, or for, in our case, couple of days on the supercomputer here at the University of Vermont. And at the end of that evolutionary process, we have the 100 finalists. We take the single champion that has the highest fitness among those 100 uh, finalists and return that to our colleagues at Tufts. And the winning design in this particular case was this robot that you see here. And this robot, although it doesn't travel very quickly, you can see that that it's built from randomly uh, actuating motors or pistons or heart muscle cells, collectively it's able to move in a more or less straight line. So the evolutionary process has found an overall design that de-randomizes the average random actuation of its component pieces. So this is the result from one run of this evolutionary process. We can rewind the evolutionary tape, create a new population of 100 random designs and run the evolutionary algorithm a second time, which will give us a second champion. We can repeat it a third time, a fourth time. We did this 100 times. It took about a month on our supercomputer uh, to do this. Simulating these soft bodied robots is computationally intensive. I've circled the, the design that I just showed you. One of the nice things about using an evolutionary algorithm is, the, is that although you cannot guarantee it will give you the optimal design, it will give you very good designs and it will give you a, a, a very large diversity of potential solutions to your given problem. That's particularly important for us because even among these 100 uh, good designs, it turned out that only five of them were manufacturable. So Doug, our, our surgeon, uh, as I'll show you in a moment, uh, it's very difficult to build these things from frog cells. He identified five of these of which he could actually build. The, one, the video that I just showed you is here uh, on the right. So we took, he took that uh, simulated one, built this up from frog skin cells and combinations of uh, frog heart muscle cells as dictated by the computer generated design. And it produced the physical Xenobot that you see in the lower uh, right. Again, it doesn't move very quickly, but it moves more or less like the, the simulation predicted that it will. Although it's hard to see in this image, uh, we're looking from above at the physical Xenobot and it is quote unquote walking along the bottom of a Petri dish and it's immersed in room temperature, fresh water, which is of course the normal environment for a frog. Whether this is a frog or an organism or a robot, we can maybe deb debate that in the Q and A. Okay, so let me show you a little bit about the manufacturing process. As I just described, we've automated the design process, but these are manufactured at the moment by hand. I'm gonna show you just a few outtakes from how, this, how these Xenobots are constructed. What you see in the video on the left, this is Doug looking through the microscope. He's got a pair of micro forceps, and he's in the process of removing some material from uh, early frog embryos. Um, so these are very early on in the developmental process of the frog. The dark gray material that you see is ectoderm. This is the outer layer of the skin that he's removing to reveal uh, the endoderm or the inner skin underneath, uh, which are the white spheres that you see. You can actually see the individual, uh, you see, actually see the individual uh, skin cells in this case. So he's trying to collect the raw material of the skin cells from which he's going to uh, construct the Xenobot uh, sculpture. In this next video, uh, I'm skipping over a few videos. He's extracted using a micro pipette, a very small tube. He's, he's extracted from the medium, uh, just these dissociated cells. 
He is then going to uh, inject them into a small well. So this gray uh, circle that you see is a small uh, concavity. He's going to inject these dissociated cells and they're going to settle into the bowl of the uh, cavity. And in that bowl, they are then going to start to spontaneously reboot multicellularity. Frog cells don't like to be on their own. They will communicate to their neighbors and, and act in a way to try and pull themselves back together. So this is clearly a very, very extrusion to the normal developmental trajectory for the frog. Um, it is pulling itself back into this pure mass of uh, skin cells. And in a later stage of this process, uh, Doug then takes this recongealed mass of skin cells and is going to go back in with his micro forceps on the left and a very small micro cauterization tool on the right. This is a very hot, very small wire, not unlike a, the old cigarette lighters you'd find in the car. And he is burning away some of the material. So he is trying to sculpt this four legged uh, creature by burning away some of the material and on the underside leaving four projections pointing upward, which, are, which will become the four legs of this uh, sculpture. Again, this is Doug just building, uh, just sculpting the Xenobot. Uh, in the functional designs that combine skin and heart muscle tissue, uh, Doug deposited deposits a thin layer of skin cells in the bottom of the well, then injects a small thin layer of heart muscle tissue on top and then injects or lays down another layer of skin cells, making something like a sandwich. And then again, removes and sculpts and scrapes away the material to get the 3D shape and the distribution of skin and heart muscle tissue as close as possible to the computer generated uh, design. Okay, so what can we do with this uh, with this technology. Um, we tried out a few applications just to see what's possible. I showed you that we can select, we can get the computer to select for uh, fast moving designs. Uh, in one experiment, Doug uh, constructed multiple instances of that one design that you just saw and put a whole bunch of these physical Xenobot clones in, uh, in a petri dish and he littered the bottom of this petri dish with a whole bunch of small red pellets. Um, this is not the surface of another planet. We're looking down in onto the surface of, uh, of the petri dish and you can see that these xenobots have moved around and they seem to be pushing these pellets into a pile. It is not clear whether that is just sort of an artifact of the system or whether they are actively trying to do that uh, together. Here is a zoomed in video of that process. You can see the simulated designs in the top half uh, pushing material together. You can see the physical Xenobot zoomed in a little bit and you can see a few, it might be hard to see in the video, there's a few of the small pellets uh, nearby. You'll notice that the Xenobots also spontaneously uh, attach and detach from one another. This is a behavior that kind of comes for free from these, from these uh, new living systems that maybe, again, the evolutionary algorithm could select for and exploit if we would like these xenobots to work together at a larger scale. Here's, again, an even more zoomed in version of this process. And in this particular case, we captured a single xenobot, which at the bottom seems to be uh, shepherding this small pellet to the right. This was particularly surprising because, as I mentioned, these xenobots are built just from skin cells and heart muscle cells. There is no reproductive system, there is no, uh, there are no sense organs, and there is no brain. So as far as we knew, there was no way for these xenobots to sense their environment and react to it. However, these particular machines are not built from dumb components like metal and electronics and ceramics. They are built from intelligent components. So individual cells are themselves very complex machines. They have their own abilities to sense their local environment, send information about what they've sensed to their neighboring cells, and act on what they sense and what they're hearing from their, their neighbors. So it's possible that we got this particular behavior of sensing and reacting to this small pellet for free from these xenobots. And we've been exploring how that might occur in some simulation work. 
Um, we've been exploring this because another potential application of this technology are medical applications. Uh, intelligent drug delivery is becoming a very important uh, uh, area of interest in robotics. Um, however, one of the challenges of intelligent drug delivery is the xenobots, uh, or sorry, most micro robots are built from artificial materials, which the human body hates with a passion. But if we can create 100% biologically compatible and biodegradable small machines, they might be the perfect vehicle for uh, drug uh, transport and delivery. Here's another evolved design which had a hollow core. So if we placed a small yellow pellet of drug inside uh, that xenobot, it can actually move with the drug inside its own body. And in a future medical application, it may be able uh, to uh, deliver drugs to particular places inside the human body safely and without triggering the human immune response. Another function you get for free uh, from xenobots is that if they are damaged, they will spontaneously start to uh, heal themselves back up again. In the case of the xenobot, we can observe this grave injury and watch in detail how the xenobot recovers. It is very difficult to watch an organism recover from grave damage. First of all, it may not recover. And most of the recovery mechanisms are going on inside the organism and are difficult to observe. So all of the examples I've shown you so far, these are engineering applications, but we're particularly excited about Xenobots serving as a new scientific instrument. We could evolve not just fast moving Xenobots or collaborative Xenobots, we could evolve uh, imageable Xenobots, Xenobots that are good at advertising their internal function. We could observe them uh, battling with the cancerous tumor, we could observe them regenerating lost tissue, and this could have important implications for regenerative uh, medicine uh, and cancer research. Uh, just to finish up, um, what I showed you on the right was automated design of computer designed organisms. Uh, at the moment, the construction of xenobots or CDOs is manual. We'd like to replace that with an automated manufacturing process like bioprinting so that we could mass produce these computer designed organisms. And CDOs is complementary to GMOs or genetic engineering. Uh, it may be possible to combine these two technologies uh, in the coming years so that we could task an AI method with uh, tinkering with the genetics of organisms to make them increasingly open to suggestion, make it increasingly easy for us to deflect that developmental trajectory to even more novel uh, types of living systems. So just to finish up, uh, there's a link to more information about computer designed organisms. This work uh, was basic research funded by DARPA. We're coming towards the end of our DARPA contract. We are now taking uh, offers and, and uh, of, of, uh, funding partnerships. If you're interested in talking more with us about that, uh, please feel free to email me, the email address there. And I'll just finish by uh, acknowledging the fact that most of the hard work here was done by uh, Sam, Doug, and my, my colleague, uh, Mike at Tufts. Thanks very much. Happy to take some questions.